you know, art imitates life, and uh, how games and film are all obviously looking at those things as well. So obviously, games and film, and especially gaming now at Microsoft, you got a wide range of game genres. You got stylized, you got casual games, you got a bunch of stuff. But I'm going to be focusing on what my challenges are and what I'm working with a group of people on. So it is going to be very focused, but I think at the end when I tie it all together, you'll kind of get some ideas about how that could also serve other needs. In fact, just talking to Elaine in a breakout, you know, we had talked about the work I'm doing and how like that might even help her with the group that they're doing at UC, or, uh, the group at UCLA and the research they're up to. So, all right, let's take it away. So. Um, Here's the overview real quick, a little bit about me, central media, we'll talk about film and games, and at the end, technology and hardware, I'll kind of touch on some uh, Kinect stuff along with uh, the Microsoft uh, Xbox Smart Glass that was announced at E3. So from Sandusky, Ohio, <laughs> uh, went to Bowling Green, graduated with a dual major in BFA computer art and drawing. Uh, my first graduating uh, demo reel was done on Atari SDE with four megs of RAM, and you had to script everything, and there was no saving to the hard drive, all floppy disk, and 16 colors. And uh, so graduating, I had put together this band called the Ungrateful Dead that was a bunch of skeletons <laughs> playing. And you know, this was my demo reel, and I was ready to go work for ILM. Um, but no, that did not happen. Uh, went on to the industry, and so now I've been in it 20 years. And uh, this is a little bit of work history of the places I've been at. Um, I've been involved in every aspect of art, from animation to modeling to texturing to art direction to lighting to everything you name it. And for the last uh, 10 to 12 years, been really focused on building content, creation pipelines, workflows, training, art direction, et cetera. Been at Microsoft for a year now. So here's some of the projects I've worked on. Um, worked on the movie uh, Shrek and Ants and various other video games and things around the world. Spider-Man 2 when I was at Sony. And now I'm at Central Media and uh, I'm working with a multidisciplined team of people that, um, so we've got audio guys, graphic designers, tech artists, animators, concept artists, modelers, etc. And then I'm the art director, one of a couple in the group, and what we do is we oversee all first-party development for entertainment-related projects at Microsoft. So it's everything from video games to narrative design, uh, potential projects and ideas, the tablet PC and Windows Phone, et cetera. So um, it's actually a pretty exciting job because you're never really focused on one thing for too long, or if you are, that's your main focus, and we call those high touch focus, and then I'll have like medium and low touch where I'm like doing a bunch of things and collaborating with others. But you know, amazing group of people that I work with. So right now my, my focus and challenge, I'm specifically tied to a, to a 360 game, and it's being developed in Germany uh, by Crytek. So I'm over there like every six weeks working with them on their pipeline and, and getting those visuals to where the game needs to be. So I oversee projects like that. I'm also working on various entertainment-related other side projects. Um, the Immersive Believable content is going to be a focus of this because I'm tasked with a strike team and I'm working with a bunch of people on solving believable characters. So yes, they don't have to be photorealistic, but they got to be believable in a way that connects the viewer or the game player with that character so that you know an emotional connection is formed. So. You know, you want to play mystery games and be able to look at the face of the person to see if they're lying. You want to have love stories that have emotion. So, you know, what is it that takes, what what take what what does it take to create that? So, obviously with um, oh, and actually I'll go back real quick. So narrative design, transmedia as well. So um, that's a, a really exciting opportunity um, to work on graphic novels and other new forms of business. And then at the end we'll get into the smart glass stuff that I'm working on. So. Games have come a long way. So this is uh, Halo 1, and you know, uh, obviously with graphic improvements over the years, games are getting closer to film. So you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't do this kind of stuff because you didn't have enough memory, enough you know, hardware, software wasn't there. And uh, where things have gone recently is that we are getting, we're bridging that gap. And there's some things I want to talk about from lessons learned of working in film, going back to games and back to film and back to games that I've been able to you know, incorporate into workflow and pipeline. So um, in this case here, you can see we took, you know, Halo 1, and then coming out this fall is Halo 4. So big improvement in graphic, you know, visual fidelity. 
you can see depth of field, you know, there's t color tone mapping, there's high polygons, there's, you know, really immersive, interactive, dynamic lighting. Here's another screenshot. Look at the atmospheric haze, you know, and that, the, you know, it almost looks like a still from a movie, and this is runtime. And then here's a hallway. Again, dynamic lighting, you know, you're walking down the hallway and the shafts of light have the god rays, you're, you know, you're interacting with the lighting and the environment, destruction, et cetera. So it, it's not just about the technology of sure, sure it helps. I mean, having more RAM and having, you know, better GPUs, et cetera, is gonna help, but, you know, staffing and specialization, pipeline workflow, and the industry maturing as well. So if you think about how long films have been around, I mean, their, their, their process for creating film from pre-production all the way to final, I mean, that, that process has been around a while. And why, while small, small changes might happen over various studios, you know, the, the process itself has, you know, been in place. Well, games are really, you know, not that old yet. And, uh, and especially as you get into larger blockbuster titles where you got teams and teams of people and, you know, you can have hundreds of people, that workflow and that pipeline is still being tuned and crafted. And there's some things that are still missing from games that, you know, I'd like to see uh, game studios adapt that do mirror the film pipeline. So here's a case here where I went to EA, and at the time I went there, they had level designers lighting the levels. And level designers were not trained in art. They didn't have a lighting background. They were just placing little point lights down the hallway. and. And visually, you know, it, it, it well below the bar of what they were expecting. So I was one of the first film guys to get hired in at EA back in 98. And uh, I said, let me take a crack at this. So I went in and I worked with a programmer and I said, you know, give me spotlights, give me all these controls, give me these, this functionality and so that I can properly light this level. So him and I worked together for a couple of days and we turned this around in a matter of a week and presented this back to the team. and. You know, they were really blown away by it. And what it was was it showed that specialization is important. Having dedicated lighters that understand how to light do the lighting, not having people that are just kind of filling in and, you know, being a generalist. So that ended up really changing the way EA looked at specialization. In fact, right after this, I was meeting with Human Resources Department to define job roles for lighters and others that we could specialize. So same thing after this, I went on to Tiger Woods and, uh, hired a, a rigger and you know this is a, a, a technique in the film industry you have rigging departments and people that build the skeleton of the character and you know have this expertise about how to rig shoulders so that they bend properly etc so we brought in the first dedicated rigger to ea and he worked with me on tiger woods and rigging and the results you know the quality bar went up again creating more believability in characters and an environment so this is a typical um game art team. I mean, you can see the amount of specialization. Now, this is, you know, for larger blockbuster. Obviously, you know, smart startup companies aren't going to have this, but I just got done working on a game called Red Faction Armageddon, and I had 44 artists reporting to me, and they, this is how the staff broke out as far as specialization. So getting guys in for lighting, UI, weapons, prop artists, people that understand organic modeling versus hard surface modeling, building objects. I mean, you know, that was a pretty... Uh, pretty good team of, of specialists, but we're still not where the films are. I mean, here's a, uh, just adding to that, imagine now added on top of that, a, a typical film, you know, crew also has claw sim departments, hair sim teams, storyboard teams, matte painting departments, animation specialists that might just animate the cat, and then the other guy's like, I'm the horse animator, and you know, they, they got their special training. Then you have VFX specialists that come in, it's like, I'm the lava guy, I'm the you know, smoke and steam, I'm the laser guy. Uh, and more importantly is they've got, you know, they've got dedicated teams working on facial technology and the key to believability, right? Like I can say for a fact, you know, I worked at DreamWorks. We had a department there of, of experts that were, you know, leading the innovation in the entire world about how to do facial rigging and understand muscles and how muscles move so that the face on Shrek could hold up to a close-up and have believability. And it's that kind of knowledge and it's that kind of attention that really does, you know, take movies like Shrek and other movies and, you know, <laughs> push them into that believability, whereas the game industry still doesn't have that. And they might have one guy dedicated to it, or they might be relying on a third-party outsourcing house to do it, but then that company might not have the same sort of, you know, TLC love and att attention that, you know, it needs from the internal ownership. So, um... 
film tricks and techniques and pipelines are influenced on how games are being created. So I'm going to show some examples. Obviously, I talked about memory and RAM, budgets, you know, determine how much internal staff. So I mean budgets by money. Like, not everybody can go out and have 44 artists on staff. So I, I realize that. I'm just saying that, you know, the, to get to that quality of film, I mean, unfortunately, it will take that uh, amount of uh, monetary contribution or, or commitment. Um, practices such as calibration. I can't tell you how many game studios I worked at that still don't calibrate their monitors. And what I mean by that is setting the black levels correctly, understanding red is red, and you know, dialing it in perfectly. We had a guy at, at DreamWorks that's full-time job was every single day he went around calibrating monitor, monitors. And like an oil change, he would literally put a sticker on your monitors, like calibrated on 5.11 of 2012. And then he would be back about three weeks later, and he never stopped because there was hundreds of people, and he was going through all the time, and he was recalibrating. But you know what? That means that when directors and art directors and everyone come by and they view the work, it's exactly how it's supposed to be. I can't say how frustrating it is in the games industry where you got people sitting there with a window and the sun shining on their monitor, and they're trying to do highly sensitive lighting. And you come by to see it, and you can't even make a decision. Or you, you end up saying it's too bright, darken it, when in fact it was fine. It was our monitor was too bright. So yeah, it's just things, things like that that are steps that the game industry still is maturing and needs to you know, adopt as a practice. Um, it, you know, and again, you know, staffing, even Hollywood's outsourcing to places around the world to reduce cost. I mean, um, it's getting the best quality. I mean, it's, you know, it's all about getting quality, but keeping the cost down. And you know, I'm kind of mixed on that. I, you know, I hate to see work leaving here in the states, but you know, I understand they got to make money as well. So low poly models. You know, this is what 10 years ago. You know, you, you had limited budgets, and you know, how are you going to get believability on a face like that? I mean, yeah, you can do some really things with eye awareness and whatever. And I realize that stylization, you can do a lot with it. But I'm talking about if you really are truly trying to make a believable character. The, the polygon issues you know, weren't helping. And also the staffing, right? A lot of the best talent wanted to go to film industry and work on no budget sort of modeling. They didn't want to be like, here you go, guy. You got 250 polygons. Good luck. Go, go build a face. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was hard to get the talent. But now that the systems are coming around and the memory and the software and ZBrush and everything else, we're starting to get this. So this is a character that I had done in my last game, and this is, uh, this is actually, this is the high ZBrush model, the source, and they're able to build like film quality models, and then we low res retopologize it down to this, and so this is actual screenshot in game, you know, of what we're able to accomplish today. So talking about working with researchers and you know partnering um, Paul Debevix a good friend of mine I've known him for probably 12 years now and the work that he's done at ICT in regards to believable characters and scanning technology and you know he's a godfather of creating HDR imagery um, that kind of work is amazing because it started out in a research facility and you know everyone saw the work being done at SIGGRAPH and other events, and of course film was the first one to adapt it and make it part of the process, and then you know, it even went mainstream into photography. I mean, you got an iPhone now, you can switch it to HDR on. I mean, essentially that technology has gone out, but it took a while for games to do it because again, it was a real-time cost that at the end of the day, you could turn it on enabling HDR, but it might slow down frame rate, and then the designer's complaining, my game's too slow. So at the end of the day, you wouldn't win that battle, and it would not ship with HDR on. But now it is. It's starting to find its way into games. Um, this is a digital Emily project, and I put a link down there. But essentially, um, Paul Bevick and his guys did a scanning technology and, and created this whole interview with the actress you see on the bottom. And actually, that is the digital actress on the bottom. And the whole thing was shot as a documentary of her talking to someone interviewing her. And then at the end, you realize it was a digital person that was talking the whole time. So it was groundbreaking as, at its time and something that you know set the bar for what people were looking to do. Again, that same technology from Paul's group uh, made its way into Benjamin Button. So the, the shots of Brad Pitt you know, going through various stages of age were all digital. And it's amazing if you ever watch any of the behind the scenes footage. And that's, again, the kind of technology that I'm trying to get at Microsoft into video games. Uh, here, this is just showing that here's a, the Wikipedia explanation of what high dynamic range imaging is. This is an image I did. Literally, all I did was create some simple primitives. 
load in a, Fu a Fuzi uh, probe, which is a light, I mean, uh, HDR image that someone took 360 degrees on a, on a, think of it as like a big giant reflective ball. And I hit render and it literally, I mean, this is like no lights in the scene. This is all being lit by that probe. Mm -hmm. So uh, ambient occlusion is another thing that film was able to do that took a, took a while, but we're now starting to see ambient occlusion find its way into games. It's a rendering technique that sort of like fills in, you know, the, the nooks and crannies and details of, uh, of, of the uh, rendered image. Here's that same exact technique being used in game now, and the Cry, this is on from Crytek, the CryEngine. And then you can see when you add on lighting and diffuse maps, you know, the quality you get. Um, global illumination is the theory of this light here has energy, and this is how it works in the real world. That light's going to come down and hit this table, and the rays are going to bounce off and go over there and hit that wall and essentially keep going until all their energy dies. So light has a, a, uh, a quality about it uh, that you know, emanates across the entire room. So these, however many lights that are on here and how they light the room and they bounce around is something that computers can simulate. And again, it used to be too cost prohibitive, but now it's finding its way into video games. Uh, deferred lighting, rendering with destruction. So this is, again was a game I worked on. Um, Real-time destruction technology where you could shoot and blow up anything and fragment it and essentially real-time destruction that wasn't canned is something now that we're finding our way into games. And then a couple other things on uh, just art imitating life. So, you know, the camera, you look through it, all the things that people see in the real world, what cameras are things that we want to now start to get into video games. So it's depth of field, blur, uh, glare, chromatic aberration, motion blur, lens, lens dust, film grain, et cetera. Those are all things that are going to help that believable, immersive game. For And again, it is highly specific to realism, but those are the things that uh, are starting to find their way into games. And here's an example of a camera lens adjustment in the Unreal Engine. So it, as you move the camera around and look at bright spots, the lens will actually you know, auto-expose. Depth of field, here's a game Madden coming out, and actually it came out today. <laughs> um, they're starting to you know, incorporate depth of field and motion blur into video games. Uh, you know, here's Alien, right? Remember that the, the film stock and the, and the technique and basically it had an anamorphic lens effect, uh, you know, whenever you pointed the real camera in the movie at a bright light source and those kind of things are finding their wells at, well, way into games as well. And it is a stylistic choice. I mean, you know, you don't want to go overboard and get lens flare crazy, but it is an uh, interesting homage to film. Um, here's a thing called uh, cross-processing. So this is a technique that's been in photography for a while and it actually was discovered you know back in the older days of developing film where you'd screw around and develop film in the wrong type of solution and it would colorize it well those same type of effects are being applied to games and movies and they're called lookup tables so it's that's the exact same image and I'm going in and I'm remapping all the colors to shift given a stylistic look and effect so now we're on to believable characters. So you know, Lord of the Rings, Gollum, you know, that was a big uh, challenge at the time for uh, Weta Studio. Here's a character that was going to be literally, I mean, filling up the entire screen and interacting and a key part of the story. And I mean, they really had to pull off a lot to get people in the audience not to, you know, see the uncanny effect and, and be repulsed by this digital character talk. And not just repulsed because he, he's not the most attractive guy. But repulsed in the sense that you got to believe that that character is actually real or a character in the movie and not a digital actor. So this is Shrek. I worked on Shrek. I actually developed his uh, skin shader and all of his uh, clothing and technology. And again, the amount of work that went into the facial control, I mean, he had hundreds and hundreds of muscles and sliders and everything to do to get that kind of acting believability. And, you know, I think that he's proven that, you know, that you can believe a, a, a green ogre exists and you can, you know, connect with them. So this is Andy Serkis doing a motion capture shoot for Lord of the Rings for Gollum. So this is a technique that uh, Avatar used as well and you'll see in a minute, but it's essentially it's digitizing, scanning the face so that it captures all of the subtle details in his face so that that can translate then to the computer model. And you can see that, that that's the same technique that was used on Avatar. There's a couple shots from that. that tech, this technique of scanning faces is starting to come into video games now. And in fact, some of the research I'm doing with Paul Devevic right now on my project and others is looking in that same technology. 
this is LA Noir and they did it and you actually can interview people and kind of see their faces if they're nervous or whatever. They're still not quite there. I actually think they did not do the best job. They got a long ways to go, but it was a nice step to see the industry finally starting to incorporate this technique. And here you can see a more expressive character that you come across in the game. So uh, skin, another thing to you know, creating believable characters. Subsurface scatters, a phenomena. You hide, hold a flashlight behind your hand or your ears, and basically there's no bone there, so the skin shows light through it. And then a teapot made out of skin. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a uh, NVIDIA technology showing some of the skin development. You know, skin has lots of, it's amazing CG skin, especially the film industry and what we did for Shrek. I mean, it had dermis and epidermis and all the different layers of skin that let light penetrate through it and bounce out. So it, it, it's not just colorizing it red in certain areas that it is the uh, influence of light. Here's some characters that you see from video games that you know, are starting to get better results with creating human characters and skin. Now this is a stylized approach, but I really love the character design. Again, if you've played this game, I mean, they got really nice believability and emotion. You know, you do connect with these characters. So the Uncanny Valley, just real quick, um, you know, this is a term that has been around long before computer graphics, but computer graphics have adopted this term to be that w weird game, game character or film character that doesn't quite look believable and leaves the people and the audience feeling a little like repulsed, right? And here's a, uh, an example. A lot of it showed up in the early robotics. I mean, you can look at that and there are elements of that that look real, but because it's just enough off, it's got a, an eerie repulsive feel to it. And that same thing you know, shows up in movies. And this is a chart here. If you do a Google search or Wikipedia or Bing or whatever, and you look for Uncanny Valley, it shows you the further you get away from human likeness, you're actually OK because you, know, you don't criticize <coughs> stuffed animals and the Lion King and Veggie Tales like you do <coughs> something that's closely along the human likeness line. But these movies here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I worked on Polar Express. This is actually one of my shots, and I think it holds up real nice in a still. But as you, uh, those of you that might have seen it, know that it is creepy in the way they talk. And again, they hit the uncanny valley. And I can get into a breakout discussion of why that happened and and uh, how they decided to. Uh, redo the voices at the last minute and the eye awareness and everything suffered so those were the results this is another shot that I did holds up real nice as a still but in motion you know it's that uh, not so believable character so Beowulf got criticized and LA Noir did as well uh, going on to believable environments, I just want to point out a few examples. Uh, this is Battlefield 3 starting to get this is all real time you know the, the lighting and the feel and the mood I mean Yes, it's a shooter type game and they're not for everyone, but it doesn't don't go by the genre. I mean, it, this could be everything from a, a horror story to a detective to whatever. Same thing, you see the film effects. Polygons, just real quick, just, uh, we used to be low polygon and LODs. LODs have, uh, is a technique that, imagine a tree up close is really high, high resolution, it has all the detail. But you cannot draw that tree and hundreds of those trees all at that detail. So the farther away they are, we do these techniques where we reduce the amount of polygons. But the problem is, as you move the camera and I'm walking down the street, you start to see those differences pop and change in the silhouette. Well, those things pull you out of, of, of immersion, right? Because you're trying to walk and look down the road and you're seeing trees pop. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, that's something I'd like to see solved coming up here. Anti-aliasing, same thing. When, when you have a, a, a bad anti-alias look, you get the flickering little pixels. Uh, this basically says, um, this is a cinematic from Saints Row and how it looks pre-rendered and it's actually a really well done job. But then when you get in the game, this is what it looks like in game. I'd like to see the two of them come a lot closer and I'm looking forward to you know, the next 10 years and more the industry goes to be able to have the whole game look like the previous slide. So wrapping this up here is a lot of things I talked about have been done in film, and they basically found themselves getting applied to games. 
But I also want to, it was kind of neat to see now there's this transition of games given back to film. So even kind of stuff Ken was talking about where real time, uh, real time it, rapid iteration is, is huge in games as well. So this is a, a character, and this is from my game here, Red Faction. Now this is a tool that I worked with programming and you know, our computer scientists on, giving the artist a control to drop in a character into the viewer rotate around it with the joystick and rotate the light around to see how it looked and then be able to interactively use the d-pad and you can see another version there but they could use the d-pad on the joystick to change the background plate and all the lights around it so i as an art director could say okay i'm looking at an asset what does it look like in lava because they're part of the game takes place in a lava cave what does it look like in ice what does it look like in crystal so it was a really nice tool that sped up their workflow and was awesome for interactive you know art direction feedback and and real time changing and you can see you know this real time technology found its way into avatar james cameron using a virtual camera on the set of avatar and then ilm's using pre visualization tools so that they can lay out sets and get immediate feedback with camera and timing and everything else so it's kind of neat to see that you know even they're valuing games and the ability to have real time rapid iteration and how that's come back to you know, find its way into there. Bonus topic real quick, and I'm gonna go through this fast because of time. The um, Kinect came out, you know, a few years ago and it was a cheap depth camera uh, that had a depth sensor on it. And at first, you know, we, Microsoft was like, we're gonna release these games and you know, we're not gonna let this open to the public. And uh, these are some of the games that came out at launch. Come on. Fun Labs were continuing to create new games for the Kinect. In fact, it's kind of neat if you ever go, I mean, a lot of the coolest uses of the Kinect are now uh, non-game related, the, you know, texture map myself or change my clothing or do fun stuff. And uh, they continue to innovate and I'm really, you know, happy to see that program still going and uh, the cool things that they keep coming up with. But my point on this one, going into smart glass, is that when this first came out, there was a bounty for $3,000 offered for the first person that could hack the Kinect. And, Microsoft didn't like that, and they came back and issued a, um, a threat saying that you know, legal action will be taking place. And there was a lot of behind the scenes meetings that said, uh, and there's a statement from Microsoft, you, know, you don't wanna deal with Microsoft's lawyers. <laughs> um, basically then, uh, the company had meetings and they, they, they talked and they said, you know, maybe this is the wrong thing, we should allow this open community to come in and develop for it, maybe it makes more sense. So they did reverse their stance and they did release it. But interestingly enough, days after the uh, Kinect came out, an open source driver to read Kinect data on a PC appeared within days. So it was hacked right away. Now, the, all I want to end on these is that some of the innovative uses I think that are neat about the Kinect is here's a case where Boeing's using it to visualize. Here's a case where medical, you know, you cannot, you scrub down in the, in the germs, you can't touch the x-rays. So now physicians are literally able to bring up the x-rays on a screen and wave their hand and do these motions and zoom in and they're able to look at x-rays and you know it's kind of neat to see it find its way into medical and air aviation and fun things with people controlling airplanes all with hand movement and he's flying the airplane around uh, other educational uses innovative presentation tool virtual piano navigating vocabulary sign language i mean these are all things that are out there that people are doing that excite us too there's an organization, you see Microsoft's now embracing it, which brings to the last three slides, which is this was announced at E3, and uh, this is a smart glass technology that's gonna be coming out this fall from Microsoft. What is it? So it's an exciting way to interact with content, uses your existing devices, the idea of existing apps talking. So I'll speed this up, because Noah's giving me the, the <laughs> stinky eye. Um, the, uh, this is a free thing coming out, and this is we're really excited about this. And again, we're right opening this up, the open SDK to the community. But essentially, um, what they talked about is you'll be able to have your existing devices, whether it's an iPad or a phone, and it'll pair up through a protected uh, Wi-Fi with the Xbox, and you'll be able to use that as a second or third controller or a video screen or an extra app that has information on it. So example, Game of Thrones comes on, and because it's paired, you don't even need to start it. It automatically launches its app and says, oh, you're watching Game of Thrones. I'm gonna start streaming content to your, to your uh, device. 
that's going to start telling you about key information in the in the show you're watching and where you're going or in a video game you could have your map come up on the phone so that you don't have to take up and hit pause or select to see where you're at going in the game so it could be an extra you know uh, video screen for that and then madden everyone knows that you, when you play two player the other person can see your plays well now you can have your plays show up on your phone and you could change plays or a column from that and not be affected and that's it Thank <laughs> you.